Good evening. Uh, thank you to the Missouri State Archives for the invitation to speak uh, on Missouri women's involvement in um, the fight for women's suffrage. Uh, as we commemorate the 100th anniversary of the ratification and passing into law of the 19th Amendment, Amendment we remember uh, and we are reminded daily that the right to vote is essential to citizens of a democratic society. As many of you are aware, women's suffrage was the last resolution passed at the 1848 uh, Seneca Falls, New York Women's Conference and made part of the con uh, convention's Declaration of Sentiments, also known as the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments, and signed by 100 of the 300 attendees, 68 women and 32 men. The woman's suffrage resolution passed after a passionate appeal by abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who was also barred from voting because he was a black man. Douglass outlined the necessity of the vote and by uh, the support of the men of the convention, the resolution passed. In the closing remarks of the declaration, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote, we anticipate no small amount of misconception, misrepresentation, and ridicule. We shall employ agents, circulate tracts, petition the state and the national legislatures, and endeavor to enlist the pulpit and the press on our behalf. Stanton was right. On the road to getting the vote, suffrage women experienced much misrepresentation, misconception, and ridicule. And the leaders of this movement, middle and upper class women, turned against former allies to achieve the gold. In 1848, there were no Missouri women at the convention. As a slaveholding state, anti-slavery efforts from which the women's rights movement sprang were more individualized and personally dangerous in Missouri. So, like other Southern women, women's suffrage came to Missouri after their war work and at the end of the Civil War. Phoebe Cousins and her mother worked during the Civil War with the St. Louis Ladies Union Aid Society. Phoebe became involved in the American Equal Rights Association, which had formed in 1866 to secure equal rights for all citizens, especially men and women blacks and whites, regardless of race, color, or sex. The organization included men and women, blacks and whites. It was created at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention. The American Equal Rights uh, Association ended in 1869 over disagreements about the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted the right to vote to African American men, but not women. Cousins had attended the um, association's meeting held in New York as the Missouri delegate. Phoebe Cousins attended and earned a law degree from Washington University in St. Louis in 1871. This made her the first female graduate from an American law, uh, law school and the first female graduate of Washington University. She was licensed to practice in Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, and Utah, but she became more noted as a suffragist. She spoke on the subject of suffrage at uh, Westminster College in Fulton in 1870 and went on to become a national speaker and writer for the suffrage cause. Like Stanton and Anthony, Cousins opposed the 15th Amendment because it did not include the word sex, which would have franchised women along with black men. The suffrage movement split over women's stance on the amendment and the two and two suffrage associations were formed, the National and the American. When the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American uh, uh, Suffrage Association compromised over their differences and merged in 1890, uh, Cousins was not so forgiving. She renounced both suffrage and temperance. She went on to work for the beer lobby until age 68, and she died in St. Louis at age 71 in 1913. Another member of the St. Louis Ladies Union Aid Society, Virginia Minor, took her support of suffrage to the Supreme Court. In 1866, Minor wrote a letter to Senator B. Gax Brown to thank him for supporting suffrage. 
because she had several of her friends signed as well, the letter became a petition and began an annual occurrence of Missouri suffragists petitioning the state legislature on behalf of suffrage. A former suffrage movement began in Missouri when Minor and her peers formed the Women's Suffrage Association of Missouri in May 1867. Seven women chartered the organization and elected Minor its first president. Within a few months, the organization hosted Susan B. Anthony in St. Louis. Their purpose was to get women's suffrage, uh, amend, women's suffrage amendment to the Missouri State Constitution or one to the United States Constitution. In 1868, the organization petitioned the Missouri State Legislature asking that the, the protection of the 14th Amendment, that no state shall make or endorse any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States be applied regardless of gender. The petition was rejected by a large margin. Beginning in 1868, suffrage women attended every convention of both the Democratic and Republican parties, uh, making an appeal for endorsement of their interpretation of the 14th Amendment. Like Cousins, Minor was a member of the National Women's Suffrage Association from its founding in 1869 and opposed the 15th Amendment because it did not include women. In 1869, Minor spoke at a national suffrage convention held in St. Louis and made the same argument. As a citizen of the United States, she had the same rights that every citizen of the nation had. Minor, along with suffragists across the country, decided to test her theory in fall 1872 when she tried to register to vote in St. Louis for the general election in November. She was denied by Register Reese Heberset, who defended his decision saying she was not entitled to be registered or to vote because she was not a male citizen but a woman and that the Constitution of Missouri and the registration law of the state declared that only male citizens of the United States are entitled or permitted to vote. With the exception, with the assistance, I'm sorry, of her lawyer husband, Minor filed a lawsuit. The case made it to the United States Supreme Court. In 1875, in the case of Minor versus Hepperset, the United States Supreme Court upheld the Missouri court's ruling that the state's refusal to allow women the, the exercise of the vote was constitutional. The National Women's Suffrage Association came up with the language for the 19th Amendment in 1878. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And in 1879, a new St. Louis Suffrage Association was established with, Minor, with Virginia Minor as president and Phoebe Cousins as one of the three vice presidents. Minor testified before the U.S. Senate in support of women's suffrage in 1889. And in 1892, she was made honorary vice president of the Interstate Women's Suffrage Convention. She died in St. Louis in 1894, willing half of her estate to Susan B. Anthony. The St. Louis Republican newspaper noted that her work on behalf of women's suffrage placed her beside Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, Julia Ward Howe, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. On the opposite side of the state, Pennsylvania transplant and abolitionist teacher Sarah Chandler Coates settled with her lawyer husband, Curtsy Coates, in Kansas City. After the Civil War, she uh, headed a local women's suffrage club and was visited by her friend Susan B. Anthony several times in Kansas City. Coates helped form the group that would eventually become the Missouri Federation of Women's Clubs. One of the oldest affiliated clubs was the Kansas City Athenium, formed in 1894. Its members advocated for women's suffrage, juvenile court reform, child labor laws, and educational reform. After the turn of the century, Suffrage work lagged in Missouri until 
Florence Wyman Richardson and her daughter, Florence Richardson Usher, took up the cause. In 1907 and 1908, Florence Usher began writing to prominent suffrage leaders about the movement. The National American Women's Suffrage Association put her in touch with Laura Gregg, an Illinois suffragist, who was collecting signatures for the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, uh, the nickname for the Women's Suffrage Amendment. The petition campaign strategy was find influential people in the community, do a house-to-house -house canvas, and target Grange and Farmers Alliances throughout the country. Young Florence contacted the West End Business Men League who had endorsed women's suffrage in local elections if 25% of the taxpaying city resident females petitioned for it. By 1910, Florence found other like-minded women and a group began meeting. Because she was a new woman, Florence wanted new woman tactics and favored the more aggressive techniques of the British suffragettes. So she worked to bring Emmeline Prankhurst, the leading British suffragette, to St. Louis. Two anti-militant action British suffrage speakers came to St. Louis before Usher got Pankhurst. In February 1911, Usher, her mother Florence Richardson, and two other women formed the Missouri Equal Suffrage Association and joined the National American Women Associ Associ Suffrage Association. At the same time, suffrage clubs formed in Warrensburg and Kansas City and affiliated with the Missouri Equal Suffrage Association. By May 1911, the Kansas City Women's League had 75 members. Emmeline Pankhurst came to St. Louis in November 1911. The St. Louis Republican newspaper reported that speaking to a 2,000 person audience in formal dress at the Odium Theater, um, Pankhurst, in a talk entitled, Why Do M Women Want the Vote? For the Same Reason Men Want It. Pankhurst urged militancy. She was scheduled for a second speaking engagement in St. Louis, and Florence Usher had engaged her husband to introduce her. A professor at Washington University who was just starting in his career, he had second thoughts. He backed out of the engagement because he did not support Pankhurst's tactics of militant confrontation but a more measured educational campaign. As married life and her husband's career advanced, Florence Usher and her mother dropped out of the active suffrage campaign. Matilda Dolly Dahlmeyer Sheldon, born in Jefferson City, but educated in Washington, D.C., where she was exposed to women's social and political clubs, returned to Jefferson City, and organized the Jefferson City Equal Suffrage League. She was an activist and campaigned for more than, uh, in more than 20 counties pushing women's suffrage. In 1918, the Daily Capital News claimed that she was considered to be the Joan of Arc of Missouri, having led the largest crowd that ever gathered at the Jefferson City Courthouse. If you see pictures of Sheldon, you can see um, how she's really a um, charismatic woman. You can tell from the pictures that you know she believes in what she's talking about, she is passionate about that, and people find her magnetic. Um, in 1919, Sheldon becomes the first woman to hold a political office in the state of Missouri, and uh, she remains in politics throughout her long life. She was elected to the Jefferson City City Council in 1924, and she died on January 17, 1980, at the age of 95. African American women's support for women's suffrage paralleled but de developed differently from that of white women. Their participation in the suffrage movement was shaped by black activism and white racism. For white women, 
the passage of the 19th Amendment was the end of a more than 70 year struggle. For African American women, the struggle continued. African American women have been part of the suffrage movement from the beginning. At a meeting of the American Equal Rights Association held in New York City on May 9, 1867, Sojourner Truth said, I feel that if I have to answer for the deeds done in my body as much as a man, I have the right to have just as much as a man. There is a great stir about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about the colored woman. And if colored men get their rights and not the women theirs, you see the colored men will be masters over the women and it will be just as bad as it was before. So I'm for keeping the thing going while things are, are stirring because if we wait till it is still, it will take a great while to get it going again. The push for suffrage did keep going and even Though black women worked actively in the suffrage movement, they remained invisible. As with the abolition movement, organizations were segregated by race and by gender. In the middle and far west, five clubs represented black women in the cities. The Chicago Women's Club, the St. Louis Suffrage Club, the Jefferson City Francis Ellen Watkins Harper Club of Missouri, Colored Women's Club of Los Angeles, and the Colored Women's Republican Club of Denver. Most black women's clubs did not have a single focus like white women's clubs. Suffrage could not be their only cause. There was not enough black women who had the time or the education or the organizational skills to focus on a single issue such as suffrage. So their suffrage work was done within their clubs where their community work was done. Suffrage was uh, a department or committee among, uh, along with civic charity, domestic science, and education. Black women campaigned for universal suffrage or equal suffrage as opposed to woman's suffrage. They continue to argue for social reforms even after middle class white suffragists abandoned those issues. In addition to the vote allowing black women to have a political impact on issues important to them, they also saw it as a way to support black men in the South who were being pushed out of the electorate. One of those women in Missouri was Susan Paul Vachon. She was an abolitionist, she was an educator, and she was a club woman. Her family moved to St. Louis in 1882. She became involved in the Missouri State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and served as the president in 1902. She helped create the St. Louis Association of Colored Women's Clubs and served as president in 1903. She was also instrumental in having the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs come to St. Louis in 1904. The association, uh, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs also has its um, history in Missouri. In 1895, the president of the Missouri Press Association, wrote to a friend in London, England, while Ida B. Wells was traveling and publicizing uh, lynching in Europe and collecting uh, resources to combat uh, lynching in the United States. The president of the Press Association wrote to his friend and said, do not believe her. Black women in the United States are lies and pro liars and prostitutes. This enraged black women so much so that a call went from um, Washington, D.C., the Women's Era Club in Boston, 
and a number of clubs across the United States. A call for a national convention and for a national organization came. Missouri women answered the call and they were among those women who created the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And Anna Jones was a club woman, a suffragist, and an educator, and a member of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She taught and worked in Kansas City, Missouri. She was a graduate of Oberlin College. She taught high school and was a principal in Kansas City from 1892 to, 1860, to 1916 when she retired. She served as the president of the Missouri Association of Colored Women's Clubs from 1903 to 1906. She represented Kansas City uh, Colored Women's League at the talks that created the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She traveled to London, England in 1900 for the first Pan-African Conference with Anna Julia Cooper, uh, Fanny Barrier Williams, and Ella D. Baker, along with W.E.B. Du Bois. She published an essay in, 19, in the 19, um, 1915 Crisis Magazine entitled Woman Suffrage and, Suff and Social Reform. Another woman who was a leader in the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs was Josephine Salone Yates. Yates, too, was an educator, writer, and club woman. And I hope you're seeing a theme here that many of the leaders, uh, white leaders of suffrage in Missouri were uh, middle and upper class women but were not necessarily women who had jobs outside of their homes, whereas black women had a tendency to be employed outside of their home. But Yates was born in New York State and educated in Rhode Island. She taught at Lincoln University or Lincoln Institute at that time from 1886 until 1889 when she married uh, William W. Yates, principal of, of Philip um, School in Kansas City. As a club woman, she was the first president of the Women's League of Kansas City, Missouri, the premier um, black club in Kansas City. And on the national level, she was treasurer and vice president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs from 1897 until 1901. Then she, was, she became the second president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, uh, serving two terms in 1900 to 1904. Myrtle Foster Cook arrived in Kansas City in 1916. Cook was a Canadian whose parents had moved them to Monroe, uh, Michigan, where she uh, was educated and grew up. After her marriage, to uh, Dr. Todd, she moved from uh, where she, uh, whom she met in Kentucky. She moved from Kentucky to Oklahoma, and in Oklahoma, she became a charter member of the Oklahoma State Federation of Women's Clubs, an affiliate of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She continued her club affiliation and became the president of the Women's League, the premier African American women's club in Kansas City. She served as its delegate to the National Association of Women's Clubs annual conferences. She held several high profile positions in the association, including national program chairperson, editor of the National Notes uh, newsletter, and uh, chairperson of the publicity committee. Active in the Republican Party after the, the passage of the 19th Amendment, she worked within the Republican party organization as one of the nine members of the executive committee of the colored division in the 1928 presidential election. Parading became a tool for women's suffrage after Harriet Katie Blanche, daughter of Elizabeth Katie Stanton, called the first suffrage parade in Manhattan, New York in 1910. 
Because parading put women in the public sphere, it was dangerous because women were exposed to ridicule and physical violence. Missouri as well, was well represented in the 1913 uh, suffrage march in Washington, D.C., with a float resembling a bronze chariot with a throne upon which the president of the Missouri Equal Suffrage League sat in Greek robes, and the Maryville Women's Band led the march. It is around this time that Emily Newell Blair was offered the position of publicity chairperson for the Missouri Equal Suffrage Association, which had opened a headquarters. The organization continued to petition the legislature annually and asked that both the Democratic and Republican parties have a plank in the party platform on women's suffrage. Blair's job was to make sure the legislatures, legislators knew how many people from their district had signed petitions supporting women's suffrage. She got, the support, she got support from teachers' organizations, farmers' alliances, the Socialist Party, progressives, trade unionists, and several state reps. If you can see, you can see from that list, she is getting a wide um, a variety of people to support women's suffrage in Missouri. She organized a speakers bureau and publicized new leagues which popped up in um, Troy, St. Charles, Warrensburg, Columbia, Jefferson City, uh, California, Farmington, Mexico, and, pa and Palmyra. In 1914, the Missouri Equal Suffrage Association gathered more than 1,400 signatures and asked the legislature to put women's suffrage on the November ballot for a vote. The Senate sent the proposal back to committee shortly before the end of session, and Emily Blair sent out a press release that blasted them when she wrote, a trick seldom played, but always to avoid being recorded as voting for or against a measure. By 1916, Blair had become the editor of the Missouri Equal Suffrage uh, Association's monthly magazine, The Missouri Woman, a position she held for two years. At the same time, she became more active in the National Fe Suffrage Organization. During a meeting with Carrie Kat Chapman, Cat, president of the National American Women Suffrage Association in St. Louis, a plan was outlined for a silent demonstration during the Democratic National Convention being held in St. Louis in June. The Golden Lane demonstration was publicized and executed by the Missouri Equal Suffrage Association and was 12 blocks of more than 2,000 silent women in white dresses with yellow parasols. In some cases, the number was 3,000 silent women and uh, the hope was that there would be as many as 7,000 silent women, but some were um, afraid that of what would happen, so they got at least 2,000 and as many as 3,000 women to line uh, Locust Street um, as the delegates paraded to the Coliseum. In 1917, the Missouri Equal Suffrage Association did special issues of the Missouri Woman magazine to increase uh, support focused on specific groups such as farm women and secretaries. Um, it got a suffrage bill introduced to the House and to the Senate. Early in 1918, President Woodrow Wilson announced his support of the woman, the woman suffrage amendment and the federal House and Senate passed the bill. Alice Paul, president of the National Woman's Party, was not secure and uh, did not believe that President Wilson would support and push the amendment. And so she started what became known as the Watch Fire Demonstrations. In the state of Missouri, Governor Gardner, who had been silent about woman suffrage, publicly endorsed woman suffrage after the president did. At the end of the legislative session, he signed a bill allowing Missouri women to register and vote in the presidential election, which would have meant 
if the the uh, the amendment had not been ratified, Missouri women would have been able by that particular legislation to register and vote in the presidential election. Uh, Paul and the National Women's Party began watch fire demonstrations which called for picketing in front of the White House and it is believed they were the first to do this and other federal buildings. Many women were arrested and sentenced to jail time including at least three Missouri women. Harriet U. Andrews, Kansas City, Missouri, sentenced to five days in district jail, January 1919. Rebecca Harrison, Joplin, Missouri, sentenced, arrested, and at, on the, at the final watch fire demonstration, February 10th, 1919 and sentenced to five days in district jail and Bertha Wamley Kansas City Missouri arrested for applauding not demonstrating but applauding suffragists in court served three days in district jail Missouri women were active from 1866 until 1920 pushing for suffrage for women in Missouri but women in the United States. As we're talking about suffrage one of the things that have pop has popped up now because of the times that we're in is the fact that the story of women's suffrage becomes a story largely of white women. And one of the things that happens is that when we look back at our, at our history, we often sanitize it. Not that the people who lived through that particular period of time are sanitizing it, they're living through it and they're experiencing it. Case in point, the 1913 suffrage uh, parade in uh, Washington, D.C., 50 black women marched in that parade. 25 of those black women were college students who marched in the college division at the back of the parade. The other women were women such as Ida B. Wells who came from major cities. As a matter of fact, uh, when the call went out for women to come to Washington, D.C. to uh, uh, do the suffrage march, the conversation between the organizers, Alice Paul, and the National um, uh, American Women's Suffrage Organization was that on the one hand, we're not gonna bar black women, but on, on the other hand, we're not gonna recruit them either. Within the organization, there was conflict because one of the members of the National American Women's Association wrote to Paul and said, I hear that black women are not being uh, actively recruited for the march. This amounts to discrimination. Make the marshals realize or let make the marshals aware that black women, if they want to march, are welcome to march. Another message went to Paul that said, you know, I don't think it is on, I agree with you, I don't think that the onus is on you to encourage black women to march. So, even though uh, we see uh, the 19th Amendment as a success, and it definitely is a success for women, it was definitely a success for black women outside of the American South, because like um, Ansonia uh, Williams of St. Louis or Myrtle Foster Cook of Kansas City, they were active members of their party. They were active members of the Republican Party, and as I said, she worked in the colored division, but they were active members, uh, political members of their party and of their community. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of comments I wanna start out with though, and then a couple of questions so far, uh, but hopefully we'll get some more. Um, but uh, so um, the, one of the comments is actually from me, we have here in the Missouri State Archives what's called the Marie Byram poll book, but it's the first um, election of um, 
uh, a government official after women had the right to vote. And it happened to happen in Hannibal a week after, uh, well, that's 100 years ago, next uh -huh. week. Um, and she was the first woman to vote. But our head of reference has done a lot of research about the women who voted in that election. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's upper middle class women who come in, mostly housewives, who come in and vote early in the morning. But then when it gets to be lunchtime, you have a lot of the African American vote, women voters that come in and who have jobs who come in and vote when they can. They're not the first ones at the precincts, mm -hmm. but they're, they're exercising um, that right to vote um, as well. So uh, uh, anyway, anyway, so hope, follow our face, uh, Facebook post. We'll probably put, put a, a post up next uh, week about um, that anniversary um, as well. Uh, another comment, it's just a coincidence, but a really interesting one, is Charles uh, commented uh, that his grandmother, Kay Laymeyer, was born 100 years ago today. Uh, and that no one in the family really knew of that connection <laughs> until the centennial. And now they're very proud that their grandmother was, uh, was born um, on Women's Equality Day. So that's And now they've got to find out what her great-grandmother did. <laughs> Besides so, give birth to that baby, did she celebrate the passage? So uh, anyway, but that's that's a really interesting uh, anecdote. I'm just scrolling here to lots of people saying great presentation and thank you for your presentation um, and those kinds of, of compliments as well. So we just have two questions so far, I think. Um, and one of those is uh, someone wants to know more about uh, the Jefferson City African American Club you mentioned. I think you talked about there only being five in the Midwest and the West. And one of those was in St. Louis, yeah. and one of those was in Jefferson City. And by far, Jefferson City is the smallest city in that West. So. Well, you know, so the interesting thing about that is that Libby C. Libby C. Anthony, so it's Libby Coleman Anthony, who has a dorm, uh, a residence hall named after her on the Lincoln University campus. She was um, the. Uh, matron of girls and she taught domestic science there uh, at the same time that um, Yates was was there so they were there at the same time when um, Anna Julia Cooper came um, Libby C. Anthony was there but Libby C. Anthony was the treasurer of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs for about 12 years so she had you know a, a, a national presence and she was very active in Jefferson um, City now, um, I don't know much about the uh, Jefferson City Francis Ellen Watkins Club, except what is written in the uh, reports of the National Association of Colored Women. And she religiously wrote in there. So that's why we know that their suffrage movement was inside of their club, inside of their clubs. And we know that they did uh, a department of or a committee for. Um, those um, for for that. So my hope is uh, I have uh, a to-do list of writing. So I've collected all the information on Anna Julia Cooper's time here in Lincoln University, and I'm doing creating the framework of how I want to create the article. But Libby C. Anthony is also on my list of you know who is this woman and why is she because. Um, the um, I think it's Alan, the Alexander Street's um, Encyclopedia of Women's Suffragists. Libby C. Anthony is in it, and there is a club named after her in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> That's so. interesting. Um, so we have another question here that just came in. Um, uh, do you know how many African American women participated in the Golden Lane? You know what? I'm glad I'm, I'm glad you asked, and the answer is I don't know that. Um, I was looking at um, uh, the St. Louis um, social media and the St. Louis commemoration of the Golden Lane. Um, they have uh, several different websites out there. Uh, the, um, is it the Missouri Historical Society has some uh, websites out there and they say that black women participated but I'm going to have to go and ferret that out to see and I will go to the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs um, uh, records because if they did it's going to be reported in there so that's the first place I'm going to go <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so I'm kind of getting these out of order um, a little bit, but uh, a couple more questions here that have been asked now. Uh, they were asking when was the Golden Lane, and uh, I know it was the 1916 Democratic. Yeah, it was June, and I can't, and I don't remember the date. I don't want to tell you the date, but it's June 1916. Mm -hmm. yeah, at the National Convention. So at, it, at the it, Democratic National Convention. Yeah, it was that was held a little bit date. earlier than it is right now, because um, it was last week, I guess. The Democratic National Convention was last week this year, but but it was in June that year. It was in June that year. And so. the interesting thing about it was that uh, the week before, the Republican National Convention was in Chicago. And women's suffragists uh, marched in Chicago as well, but they got rained out. So they showed up at, and they showed up at, at the convention all wet and sloppy, but they marched. But you don't hear about that Chicago one. So I, I hope I'm getting Mel's name right. But um, Mel asked a question that a couple people have already partially answered in the chat box as okay. well. Um, but do you know how many African American women? I'm sorry, no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong question. It's Anita. Um, what do we know about the husbands of some of these activist women? Were their husbands supportive? Um, and, uh, and both Nicole and Anne have, have sort of answered that with the Virginia Minor story mm -hmm. that you thought you alluded to. But tell us about the support but, of Virginia Minor and other activist husbands. Well, Virginia Minor's husband is unique for a 19th century husband. Virginia Minor and her husband, and I can't, and right now his name, is, uh, first name escapes me, but they are from uh, Virginia, the state of Virginia. So they come to St. Louis as a young married couple. He starts a law practice. They have a child and they lose their child tragically. Somehow he, he died in some kind of accident. And so it's just them. So in order to protect her, he puts all of their assets into a trust and he makes her the executor of that trust. So that means that whatever monies they have, whatever properties they have, she has the only say over that. So when she went to vote, uh, to register to vote, they went together. Um, and when she was denied by the registrar, he was an attorney and so he, he was in the suffrage movement. We're, in a, you know, they don't say that he was in the suffrage movement, but you know, the men were in the suffrage movement. So he support, he supported her. He guided her through all, of, all of this. Um, the other really supportive husband is if you read Emily Blair's autobiography, the one that's edited by Virginia Lass, her husband really uh, took a back seat to her to support her going to Washington DC and taking you know the position that she did in the Democratic um, um, committee uh, she was the highest ranking woman in the Democratic committee she her job for at least a decade was to you know get women uh, to run for office to be elected to office and her husband you know picked up you know he her mother and her kids all went to Washington DC and she was you know she was the star of the show and he supported you know her as um, the star of the show so well, that's two great examples uh, for that and I think you'll probably find if you research the uh, biographies of many of these other women that they had supported families as well the other one you remember when I told you that the, the Florence Richardson and then Florence Richardson uh, Usher Richardson Usher's husband supported her. He just did not like the idea of militant confrontation. And he wanted what, what eventually uh, Missouri women did. They, black and white, they educated people as to why women should have the right to vote, what advantage it was, how it was not going to detract from the role of the male, but it was going to add to the fact that not everyone had the protection of a husband or a brother or a father. And so to have that vote was really, really important. But also, uh, not everyone had the influence that certain women had. So you can't impact policy if you don't have a voice. So they're, they're advocating for, for those kinds of things. So he had no problem with her being involved and pushing for, but he just did not like the suffragette tactics, which meant, you know, we confront the police, we scream at, you know, the leadership, and we get dragged off to jail and, you know, go through hunger strikes. That was not something that he wanted to support. 
Um, one last thing that uh, Chuck Lehmeyer said, it was his mother and not his grandmother. So we want to make sure that we get that right. Um, he said, I'm, I'm older than you think. I mean, so that just shows how tricky it is to kind of be like talking to you and, and looking at back. my phone for questions um, and the camera here, which I'm probably not even looking at like I should be uh, to do that. But Dr. Green, thank you for your presentation and your answers to these questions. Um, and uh, I would invite everyone um, to join us again next month uh, for our program back on a Thursday night uh, and next month uh, on the Trail of Tears. So thank you everyone for joining us and have a good evening.